Welcome, Ben. Thank you for, for joining us today. Um, my name is John. I am with our build. We'll love to uh, get a bit of background on, on yourself, Ben, if you could tell me what your role is, the company you work for, uh, and anything you'd like to, to add to the mix. Sure. So my name is Ben Stocker. I'm the senior construction technologist at Skender. Uh, Skender is a, a GC based in Chicago. Um, also have some work in Indiana as well, but based out of Chicago. Um, I've been in construction for uh, well, 14, 15 years now. Uh, I've been with Skender for the past nine years. Um, and then in this particular position, um, since what, like 28, about six years now. Um, and I was in like project management before that, but, uh, in a nutshell, what I tell people, my role as a construction technologist is just the R and D and then implementation of all new technologies that help out project teams. So any, just seeing what's out there and making people's jobs more efficient. A lot of, a lot of traveling, a lot of conferences and, and hunting. Yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot of, lot of demo calls, a lot of conferences, a lot of talking to salespeople. <laughs> it'd be, it'd yeah. be interesting to get your, uh, your top five and worst five demos you've you had. We, we could sidebar that, but that would be a good conversation to have. Hmm. Yeah, that that would be interesting. You probably. I, I don't know if I've. I, I don't have a ranking of all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure some have stood out. Um. So so tell me, Ben. Uh, you know, we've, we've known each other for maybe over a year now, two years, maybe when, when we first met. Um, but I'm curious, what drove you to the construction industry originally? Um, well, I got my degree in civil engineering and like bridge design. Um, I've always just liked the idea of building things and knowing how things are built, the physics behind it, the math behind it and whatnot. So that's why I got into structural design. Um, and then just somehow steered towards more the construction management side instead of the engineering side. I just wanted to be more uh, involved in the actual process and deal with people more instead of just doing calculations behind a computer. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, that's how I got into construction then. Um, I started off with an electrical contractor first and then moved over to the general contracting space. Um, but yeah, just always been interested in, in building things and just seeing, knowing how things are built. Where did, where did you go for your uh, civil engineering degree? I'm, I'm curious cause I did, I did civil engineering too, like structural. Uh, my second piece was in, uh, in Scotland. So I was designing, designing bridges there as well. Uh, so I didn't, oh, wow. I didn't know that uh, actually. Not, not as cool as Scotland, <laughs> but I went to Purdue in Indiana. Nice. Nice, yeah, and that's yeah. that same same story. That's funny. I didn't know you started as a as a civil engineer, I go like structural. That's I did the same, and then when I came over to Penn State, that's where I get exposed to uh, construction management, the land planning, uh, and get involved in the on the management of projects. And it's funny how you realize, oh, it's it's actually fun to be on the job side, talking to people, rather yeah. than just looking at calcs all day and and designing things. I mean, that's what attracted me to it too. Yeah, yeah, same. So you, you started uh, the sub, subcontractor, what then led you to, I'm curious about that experience and what then led you to uh, want to join general contractor? Um, I just wanted to be involved in more parts of the project. Um, I also started getting into technology, re construction technology related things a little bit while I was at the, the other company, um, but I just felt like moving over to a GC just would expose me to a lot more things. And GCs typically have uh, more tools available to them and more tools to use. Um, so I just wanted to like broaden um, what I was exposed to in that sense. Um, so that's how I got over in the GC side. And the, uh, and the attraction for improving technology, was it because of the lack of technology at the time and maybe a little bit of frustration when you know your, your mind was going, oh, I, where there should be a tech for this like we could do that better. yeah i mean i mean th my mind's always been like that i mean that's how i got into this role in general but like even at my previous company and then in early days in skender um i was just always the person trying to find new a, a new workflow to do my own job better um i mean like back uh i mean a lot of people will agree that when the ipad came out that was like such a huge uh, shift in how we're able to access all of our data mobile and whatnot. But like at that time I bought my own iPad, uh, with my personal mics, like they, 
company was like, oh no, you know, this is new stuff. They weren't really sold on it yet, but I bought my own pet iPad and had documents all loaded on there and stuff. And, um, so I was going around, had everything mobile with me. Um, I was converting everything into, at the time it was just digital paper, uh, like digital forms and stuff. We were trying to get paper free. Uh, that's when that whole thing was still just starting. Um, but then like even at, at Skender, I was just always the person trying to find my own, my own uh, new workflows just to help out me and my own projects. Um, and then it eventually just grew and grew and I was finding more and more things that uh, were just like, hey, let's turn this into a full-time position. So now I get to help out everyone's projects. Did you create that position? Were you the first one to, to get to that? Yes. Like, yeah, it, was, it, did not, awesome. it did not exist before. Um, so yeah, it's pretty exciting. Now this type of position does exist at a lot more companies. Um, definitely any larger company is going to have roles like this, but uh uh, it's still relatively new in the industry. I feel like most companies that do have this position, like most of them started around that same time, that 20, 2016, 2018 time at the earliest. Well, there's more and more technology now coming up. So it's, it's tough to keep a pulse on everything and being able to, so if you don't have someone dedicated to that, you, you're probably either missing out a lot or making a decision based on one without looking at the competition. So. That makes yep, a lot of sense. Exactly. And someone someone who's a full-time project manager or superintendent, like they don't have time to get a feel for the entire technology space. That's it's impossible. It almost feels impossible even when it's a dedicated job. <laughs> and it's a skill. <laughs> Let alone it's if a you're skill trying to it's a, it feels like it's a skill now that I'm in, you know, I was like you're running job sites and now you know I'm on the construction tech side. And it's a skill to be able to vet uh, technology, you know, who are they maybe backed with or who are they working with and what is the technology going to become? Because you could be, you could, if you're a superintendent, you could be very easily impressed on a demo. That's, you know, that's, that's the salespeople's job, but then there's a skill behind it to vet it out. Yep, exactly. I, I actually, I love that though, when a superintendent or a PM or someone will reach out to me and be like, Hey, I just saw this and it looks really cool. And they'll be like, okay, great. I did already look at that six months ago or whatever. Here's other people who are doing it better or like, yes, they do look great. I'm waiting for them to implement this certain thing. You know, maybe it's a pro core integration or whatever. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's really helpful to have that feel on the entire industry versus just getting sold on that one shiny object. And, and, and back to the, uh, the iPad revolution, you know, you talk about Procore, that's also what made Procore so successful is it, they directly design everything on the iPad side. And now I know, I know it's kind of, you guys have, you know, most of the Procore functionalities and it's something you can't do without like a superintendent without an iPad nowadays, it makes your job so much harder if you don't have that. Yeah. I, um, I can't even imagine not having that on site anymore. Well, you'd be surprised. I mean, we, we get exposed to a lot of, of course, smaller companies and, and sometimes we know we don't even give our superintendents iPads or, you know, they only have a computer and it's only the phone. And it's, it sounds like the first thing you should do before implementing a scheduling tool or anything is at least let them have their drawings in the field that they could, you know, walk the field and have that information. So they don't have a piece of paper on there in the back of their truck. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, yeah we were there. We started there, you know, uh, putting a piece of paper on the R5, folding the page, putting it at the back with tape, <laughs> marking it up. <laughs> That was, yep, that was, I'm familiar. That was a fun piece. There, there, so, there are people that still do that though. Yeah. I mean, when I, when I came to the U S then I had an internship with the company in DC and I, I guess it was 2018. Right. So it's not that, that, that old, right. It's not like we like in 2000 and that the superintendent on that job was having me like slip sheet paper and, and print everything out in my mind. I was here for a master's degree and I was like, wow, like I'm still doing this. I, I thought it was, you know, over with and we're still doing already doing iPad. So that was interesting. Yeah. What was the, uh, the, the first tech that you implemented for Scandal? Like the first like piece of software or, or platform that you um, started in the role? The, the first one that we officially rolled out like company wide that I had a role in would have been instruction site, uh, for 360 photos. Um, nice. now they're a part of drone deploy. Um, but yeah, at the time, uh, it's it's kind of a funny story. I'll tell it quick at least. At the time, I, ha I had a 360 camera and I was doing 
pretty much what Struction Site did, but just completely manually. I, <laughs> I was taking all the photos, hosting them on this website that had a 360 viewer on it for individual photos. And then I was hyperlinking each individual photo to a little stamp that I had made onto a drawing in Bluebeam. And it was a super manual process each time you did that. Um, but it got the similar results of being able to see the locations on a drawing, click on a pin, and then opens up that 360 photo. And then instruction site came along and I was like, you guys built exactly what I've been just doing manually <laughs> over here. <laughs> um, so I started using that on my own projects and then it just slowly spread until uh, we rolled that out enterprise wide. Were well, you using the, it a lot for, for, um, for like new jobs? Or I, I, when I was at, at DPR on the healthcare job we're doing because we're doing renovation we had to go in before and send with traction oh yeah taking we, pictures of we everything do a lot of, before and after we do a lot of renovation jobs so uh the existing pictures are almost more important than the progress pictures i would argue um to get those existing conditions and sharing that out to all the subcontractors who are going to be bidding on the job and stuff it's it's super important to get that existing conditions and you could also, you know, have the cover. I mean, there's only so much you could see sometimes depending on the space. So you discover new stuff as you get onto the project and say, hey, we, we couldn't have access there. Or here's the yep. here's the picture. Oh, that's fine. That was a, that's yeah. a different one. Um, what, what about now? What are some of the new kinds of tech that are interesting you? New kinds of tech. I mean, uh, totally unrelated to scheduling and what <laughs> that we're that we're supposed to be talking about here but uh the the most exciting thing for me lately has been uh radiance fields and like uh neural radiance fields and gaussian splats for 3d uh i'll call them visualizations not really 3d models but it's a it's a different way of creating a 3d model of your job site and viewing your space in 3d uh better suited towards outdoor jobs uh right now but um we don't have time to really go in depth on that, but that's one thing that uh, has interested me a lot lately. Um, but then also in, on a broader spectrum, just how much more and more of these different softwares and point solutions that we use and whatnot are being able to communicate and work together and share data and integrate data and actually talk to each other um, and yeah, use the data from each other. Like it's, it's so nice when, we, I look at uh, maybe a, a smaller company that does one thing and it's like, okay, well, we don't do all these other things, but we link up with Procore or whatever and take all this information from there and get a huge head start because of that. And then we just do our own special thing with that. So I know that's not necessarily new. Uh, software has been doing that for a while, but it's just getting more and more prevalent and the integrations are getting tighter and tighter too. So it's, uh, it's really great to be able to have that sharing of information. Um, so that's that's an exciting thing. Like you can do too. a lot, a lot with that data. There's a lot of lessons learned that you should be able to get to new jobs and you know how you you steer the ship as an organization. I'm I'm fully with you. And you know, one of the silos we fight is you have a before there, you have a schedule here, your plan there, your procurement somewhere else, your project management somewhere else. And even a my previous uh, just general contractors I work with when I was a DPR, you know, you, you still had some of those silos and it's um it sounds like common sense. Some of those are, are harder to connect, right? Some of them are harder to connect depending because it's all different companies and how do you get this? Um, but, yeah. but having that that knowledge nowadays when everything is about data is, is so important. Yeah. It's um, funny you mentioned the procurement because, well, the, the, the software that I was talking about, they just didn't name names, was actually a procurement software. So, <laughs> um, yeah. 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 I mean, there's, there's a need for that. I know. Um, when I was at, at DPR, we were, they were doing a Shark Tank competition every year where someone would pitch. And uh, there would, one of the, yeah, I, I ran in for like a collaborative platform, like, you know, team collaboration and all the lean stuff that I was trying to do. Uh, didn't win. The one that won was a procurement, uh, procurement idea to be able to connect, you know, P6 to, a, oh, nice. to another solution at the time. So that was, that was, I don't know what they did with it, but that was the, the idea that I had won because that's, that was the most important piece. Nice. It's, it's crucial. Yeah, come yeah. build without a material at hand. Makes it makes it more difficult to uh, to execute your job site. Yeah. Um, so getting, um, I know, I know, Ben, you, you you get exposed to a lot of challenges from different teams, and that's what often I'm guessing drives you to say, "Oh, I need to fix this. So I need to find the proper tech here and there." Um, I know you're not on site 
every day, but I'm curious what you hear or see in your experience as being the one of the main concerns that teams might have or challenges that they face on projects, of course, other than other than safety, because always has to be the number one. But um, what, what are the things you hear from project teams that that are some of their main main challenges on projects? Um, challenges that I get involved with, at least, because like you said, I'm not on project teams day to day. So I'm sure they're you know, daily fires that cause issues that I'm just not aware of. But uh, from the things that I'm involved with, uh, it's a lot of preventative actions to uh, save from problems happening later on. So, I mean, we're going in and like we talked about earlier, doing the 360 photos beforehand to get existing conditions, going doing uh, laser scans beforehand, initial uh, drone flights of existing conditions of a site. Um, a lot of... Uh, a lot of prep work like that, uh, pre pre preventative work to know the job site beforehand or figure out things that are happening on the job site before it becomes a problem later. Um, so that's, that's something that I'm involved with a lot. And luckily I would assume that because we take a lot of those preventative measures, they don't cause scheduling problems later on, uh, in time lost. Um, cause you know, we're, we're scanning the existing conditions, turning that into uh, existing conditions Revit models to do BIM co uh, coordination with. We're you know, doing those existing conditions, drone flights and whatnot. We're doing floor analyses to make sure we don't have floor problems. Um, we're recently getting into uh, thermal uh, scans and analysis of, of floors, building facades, roofs and stuff to make sure there aren't problems there before we start digging in. So a lot of uh, preventative measures that we take so that we don't cause scheduling problems later on. So I'm, I'm sure you're, uh, that, that, I don't know why I'm, I'm have the, the image of the McLeamy curve in my head uh, that, you know, that teach you that, you know, that shift the effort early on, it'll cost you less, but have a greater impact in the end. And, and it, that's, I mean, that's exactly, so that's true. That's the thought process. Yeah. It's spend more time at the beginning because it costs you nothing to change at that time. But once you're locked in and you're getting to the end, if you have a, a change order, a schedule change, or a design change, which would be even worse, it's mm -hmm. not not a cost of things is it's going to get you through the roof. So that's that's it's, great. That's great it's not even just a it's not even just a cost thing. It's a it's a a project health and mental health thing later on in the job too. You know, if you have to make huge changes or do large amounts of rework three quarters of the way through the job, something that you could have detected earlier on, like, you know, the superintendents, product teams have enough stress already. You don't need to add on to that. So um, anything, anything to make their job better. Yeah, it's, um, it's flagging okay. issues, right? It, it comes back down to prep as much as you can and flag issues early on so that it's better to know we have a problem and fixing it yeah. early than, than letting it drag. And then it's, yeah. Yeah. Frustration yeah figure out those roadblocks, yeah. figure out those yeah. roadblocks early on. See what I did there? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, I was, I was going to get there. I was like, maybe we wait, <laughs> we had a couple of questions down there. Um, but that's, that, that's great to hear. So, you know, pre-planning is, is, is key, right? Whether it's in design, whether it's in everything you do and more and more, we're shifting to more, um, you know, collaborative contracts too, right? You could talk about the uh, design build approach or IPD or however you're trying to do it, but it's, let's bring the right people early on so that the job gets smoother uh, because it's much harder to, to be able to, keep a job on track if you have changes at the end. Um, would you say that the lack of planning may be the lead cause of delay then uh, overall? Like you just think that that would be the thing that has the bigger impact. And when I say lack of planning, it's that, that pre-planning, right? Um, Making sure teams take enough time at the beginning. Yeah, I would say so because I mean, every, well, okay, not every, I was going to say every th problem that happens on a job is preventable. But like if all of a sudden your fancy, tile that's being imported from Italy or whatever, it gets delayed, you know, you can't, uh, there's nothing you can do, uh, to prevent that. But we'll say most problems that happen on a job site are preventable, preventable with proper planning. Um, okay. so yeah, but as far as like the biggest thing, like, yes, uh, if you plan properly, you should be able to, uh, get around any potential future issues on your project. And that kind of loops back to your idea of the more data we get on all the jobs and the more we could get this, the more we'll help the next job get set up the right way. So we have that lessons learned. That makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. So, so how, how does this tie into, uh, so this is scheduling and planning. We're going to get there, but, um, so in, in your career, what has oh, been yeah. your, yeah, this is an outbuild, outbuild talk, yeah. right? 
<laughs> yeah, it's all about about you too. It's it's nice to learn more about about that background. But um, what has been your exposure to to scheduling and planning? You know, from from college, I know we we had classes on scheduling and we learned things. Uh, to now, I'm 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 curious about that progression. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, it's as far as scheduling for the longest time, scheduling was always just done like in Excel or something. Uh, used P6 for a little short stint. Um, but then like at, at Skender, at least it was always in schedule for the longest time schedule or a Microsoft project as well. Um, we had tried using a couple different scheduling softwares, but things were still, I say scheduling just in general, but it's our schedule and our look aheads were always separated still. Um, I'm not going to like name names of other softwares, but it was, it was always separate and, you know, you could try to merge it together into one and just have one overall for everything, but like that just didn't work properly. Um, but yeah, everything was always really separate. Uh, and as of most recently before us using outbuild, we were using Microsoft project and Excel and it's, it's fine. That works, but there are just a lot of things that can be better about that when you have it all together. We were talking before about sharing data and having integrated platforms and whatnot. And um, now I know this is going to start to sound sales pitchy, but like it's a re reason really we really liked Outbuild was that it was all together and it can talk, communicate with each other, that schedule and that look ahead plan. Um, and there's mobile access and easy to share with people, uh, just all things that didn't exist before. I mean, sure, you could email around an Excel sheet or a project file or something, but there was no collaborative effort on it. Um, so, and it's no, it's no fault uh, to anyone. You had, you had the solution that you had, right? You had Microsoft project, all the planning tools that were good at what they were doing, but, um, I'd be curious in your experience, you know, the impact of having a schedule somewhere and then the field doing something else somewhere. What, what are the risks there? Uh, it's having different information in two different places. That's that's the biggest thing. I mean, I saw it firsthand on myself on projects where you create your master schedule and like, all right, this looks great, great plan. And then job happens and, or things on a job happen and that look ahead is constantly changing, but it's wildly inaccurate compared to that master schedule. And like, sure, you can go ahead and update that master schedule occasionally or something, but there was just always, there's a lot of room for a disconnect between the two um, when you have them separate like that. Um, and then, then you just have miscommunication within your team, miscommunication to subcontractors that you're working with, miscommunication to the owner. Um, Cause maybe they're referring to a date that something was going to be done on your master schedule. And it's like, Oh, well that's actually a few weeks old. Now a lot has changed on our look ahead here. Now it's, you know, a few days different, a week different. Um, so yeah, that miscommunication is a, huge source of uh, or potential air um, if you have them in separate places like that. And we, um, we've heard stories and many stories when we, you know, we talk to our build to other general contractors uh, of, I show up to an OAC and I'll look ahead some something, I'll schedule some, say something else. And that's never a good place to be in because you just feel like, oh, well, we, we shouldn't know that, but because it takes somebody to keep both updated if, if you're not using a solution like our build, it's just a people thing. And the superintendent and the PM, they have better things to do than transferring data from one or the other, even if that's their responsibility. So it feels like there was some comfort using the same tools for a while, which, you know, work, people would deliver a job, but we're getting to an age where we want to avoid that, that constant friction of a subcontractor having to call a superintendent five times a day. What am I scheduled on tomorrow? What do I do? What is the copy of the schedule? Which version yep. is it? Um, I was going to say, yeah, what's the most updated version of the schedule? Um, Cause that's, yeah, that's, that can be a bad thing too. It's a lot better. Just invite your subcontractors to your schedule so they can always see the most updated one versus just, Oh, okay. I found in my email, the one you sent me, you know, a week ago, two weeks ago, is that the most up-to-date one still? And yeah, it's, and a, it's you, a call or an email that just doesn't even need to happen anymore. Yeah. And as soon as you, I mean, as soon as you print something out, that's outdated because you know, you're doing something else somewhere else. And that, that, that's what would make it even frustrating for me on my experience on jobs. It's, you know, having to be the one constantly feeding out a PDF to everybody um, just felt challenging. And now often when we pitch up build to people and say, oh, you know, it's unlimited access. The first thing, unlimited users, the first thing that people say is, oh, people can touch my schedule. No, 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 they, they can see that list. Let them see it, let them see their plan, let them see what they're supposed to do and plan their yeah. work on their own. But even just having them see that is a huge benefit. 
Yeah. You definitely don't yeah. want them editing at your schedule all the time. <laughs> no, that can get that, dangerous. That never, yeah. that, that's, pro that's the protective part. Of course, that's a contract document, but the, the planning piece is where it should be. Uh, it, I mean, it's what makes or break a job. If, if your subs are not, or trade partners, I, I like to probably prefer to use the term, um, are not performing on the project, you're not going to perform as a superintendent or as a GC because you're not building anything. You need people to be able to do that. So uh, re remind me, how did you um, how did you come across Outbill and was there already an initiative at Scandal to improve that silo between scheduling and playing or was it a... Um, yeah, so the initiative to improve scheduling started using our previous software that we were using before. Uh, well, we were using another software and then dropped them to go back to uh, project and um, um, project in Excel. And so there was a need to make, uh, to make better scheduling, to have better scheduling initiatives and whatnot. Um, and it was kind of, some people didn't like the, the previous one we were using, uh, well enough for us to drop it as well. Um, but then people also had problems with just going back to projects in Excel. So we needed something that was better. We, we knew we needed something and then it had been, I don't remember the exact time frame, maybe a couple of years or something that we were back on project in Excel. And I had heard about uh, Pro Planner at the time uh, before it was outbuild. And uh, I just didn't know a ton about it, though. It just like seen of it, like it was one of those back of my mind things like, OK, I know I need to look into these guys when we get around to it. And um, it was finally at uh, the Procore Groundbreak Conference. Uh, it was, must have been a couple of years ago now. And uh, I just walked up and, and met you there and did a little demo and the honestly the first impression uh, you know not to toot your own toot your horn a little bit here but like you gave a good quick demo and i just got that good initial impression of like okay this is actually looks like what we're trying to do here um this looks like it could really help us um so yeah nice job on your initial demo there uh, <laughs> um but uh yeah i just got that uh, the initial uh warm fuzzy feeling uh because i can tell like you mentioned before i look at a lot of different software i have I kind of have to rely on my initial impression a lot of time because I don't have the time to fully properly vet everything I look at. It's just impossible. Um, so yeah, I got that good first impression um, from Pro Planner at the time now outbuild and um, just went on from there then with uh, more demos, trials, whatnot. Nice. And, and yeah. what would you say what the, uh, the, the key criteria is for you to be able to say, okay, this is this is the right tool for us. I was, was there any a list of, you know, we need to make sure it does X, Y, Z functionality plus ease of use plus collaboration. Like I'm, I'm curious on what that, that criteria was. Yes. There, I mean, technically, technically there is a, a checklist of sorts of criteria it needed to meet and stuff, but really what it comes down to is do, do the project teams like using this because they're the ones who are going to be using it. Not, not me, not, person signing the the check or anything it's the project team so superintendents project managers they're the ones who are actually going to be using this so we really needed to get their opinion and if they just say if they say yes this is great i want to keep using this then that's that's pretty much it that that's what sells it right there um you know it doesn't matter how good you guys say it is <laughs> it's we've yeah. got to put it in the hands of the project teams and if if they are able to use it and they get value out of it and all the additional features that it offers versus previous method of doing things, then that's what's worth it right there. That's that's like the really the final say and what sells it. And that's honestly what sold it um, for us then and why we went enterprise with it is just because the handful of jobs that we got to pilot it on, it, it was a unanimous decision from all those project teams of, yes, I would absolutely use this again. Um, so that makes, that's, that makes that your sells job it right there. Yeah, when you're trying yeah, to exactly. present this to management, it's it's not, oh, but they didn't get it. It's no, it look, listen, this is the feedback we're getting. And I'm and I'm glad it, it, it went this way. Change is the most difficult thing to to push through an organization, and especially a company like Scander. I, and especially something as important as a schedule. It's it's one thing if it's a, a small little software, you know, that just nicely like fits into workflows and whatnot. If it's a small thing, that's like easier to implement, but the schedule is so critical to a job um, and arguably one of the most important things for the project team, especially the superintendents. 
So like, it's a, uh, it's a scary thing to change. Um, cause it affects so many people in so many aspects of the job. Yes. Especially when, you know, that you've been using a solution for 20, 25 years. I mean, we've, we've talked to hundreds, maybe just thousands of general contractors and often comes down to that's great. We know all the benefits. I just don't feel like going to all my superintendents and telling them to change. Um, and, and that's, that's- that's that's actually a good point you make because I definitely see that in some other softwares I look at where I I can look at and know all right this is fantastic this would be really great for us but it's not going to fit in with our um what's a word I'm looking for um I don't want to say not tech culture that's not the right word but like it's just not going to work with our existing workflows there would be resistance to it you know maybe it adds a little bit too much extra work for people and um. Yeah, it helps to just have those relationships and know how our project teams work to be able to say, all right, this is a great solution, but I know it's not going to be well accepted. Um, it would just be a tough transition. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that was kind of going to be the case with any scheduling uh, and planning software we go with because it's just such a change. But we just, it's that, it's that Band-Aid you got to rip off and <laughs> you, you know it's going to be better. So to that point, I'd love to hear how how did you manage expectation there? Because we hear this and uh, we do those videos also, so we could we, we could share those experiences and what you've successfully done uh, with other general contractors. Because it's the number one reason why someone might be typically reticent to implement outbuild is it's the change. I got to change. We got to do something new. Yeah. It's, it's scary. So how how did you prepare, organize, transmit the message for you to have a successful transition and make sure your, your team more about it? Um, I mean, it's, it's all about how your company's pilot process works, um, and, and just knowing how to do that properly. So for something as important as changing your whole schedule software that you use, you have to have the right projects to do it. So you have to have uh, a team that's going to be willing to try something new a team. That's actually going to give good feedback. Um, I mean, those are some of the most important things right there, but the biggest one is just willing to try something new because if you force this on someone, if you force any new technology, software, whatever on someone, they're not going to want to use it. But especially as something as a schedule that people are so used to doing it in certain ways, that's going to be really tough. So you have to find the right people who are actually going to be open to try something and give good feedback. And so luckily that's what we're able to do on a handful of jobs and we are able to get good feedback and positive feedback, but, but also some constructive criticism as well. Um, some new for, you know, features that they want to see. And I know you guys have even rolled out some of the things that we've recommended. Um, so that's cool. But uh, yeah, finding the right project teams to actually pilot it is incredibly important for actually having a successful uh, rollout plan. Um, and do you use that as leverage to say, okay, we've had these, teams, the super, the PM, you guys all know, vet it out. This is why we're making the call. And then, you know, just, just because at some point you ha- it has to be a bit of a top down approach, especially with scheduling of, you know, such an organizational change. You have to have, a, at some point you have to have all your teams using it to get the benefits. So how did you present yep. that to the rest of the company and, and, and your rollout phase? Um, yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're still in our rollout phase. Mm-hmm. We yeah, are, are rollout. relatively early. Um, and we're, we're slowly getting more and more projects on, but you also can't just, you know, flip a switch and have every single uh, job switch the schedule that they're working in. So we're as new jobs start up, we are putting them into outbuild then. Um, but yeah, for the communication of that, it's we're definitely making it very important and well known that, hey, these are the other projects that have used it. These are kind of our internal champions so far. Um, and we just want to make it super clear that it's it's not just uh, Ben pushing it out kind of thing or anyone else, you know, saying, Hey, this is just what we're using now. We want to make it clear that, okay, other projects have been trying this. They're really liking it. Feedback has been all positive. Um, you know, talk to these people if you need help, um, or just want advice on how to use this. So we're just making that very clear so it doesn't feel rushed and forced on them with, with, without doing, you know, proper research or anything. And doing the new project approach or maybe product that have just started makes a lot of sense. On, on large organization, we always recommend this because there's friction on, oh, I'm halfway through my job. Like, don't don't bother me with this new schedule. Like, don't, yeah. Even if you could nope. import a file, even if you could do that. Some some teams have I, raised their hand I, saying, oh, we, we could. That's fine. Just give me the software. I know how to do it. But it's better if you let them come to you. Say, hey, this is available to you. If you want to do it, we could get you set up. If it's too much, 
let's let's do it for early jobs or new projects. So you could yeah. get trained in pre con and that rolls it out a lot easier. Yeah. And eventually it'll eventually just naturally spread more. Like my my favorite way to have new softwares grow is we just call it like an organic growth where it's not us trying to force everyone to saying, okay, every new job has to start using this, but have it grow by word of mouth internally. So I, I want, you know, from the superintendent, from this one job, who's using outbuild on one of our pilots, when they have finished that job and move on to the next one, um, you know, maybe they're working with all new project managers and project engineers and stuff who weren't, haven't been exposed to outbuild yet, but then that super is like, no, we're using outbuild on this. So it just organically grows in that sense. And then those people move on to the next job and say, oh, wait, no, we're definitely using this now in case it hasn't spread that much yet. So that's, that's the best way I feel like for things to grow because it's, they're using it because they want to, not because we're forcing them to. Yeah. That's, that's awesome to hear. It's, it's, I think where your success was is finding the right team to pilot it. Uh, Cause sometimes you try and put it on a team that there's not in the right stage. And then you never, not to put it on, on you or on the software, but you never give a shot, the right a tool, the right shot. And then you get, you get feedback and doing it on multiple projects too. You get different feedback from different teams, things that people picked up, put it and pick up. And then that helps you say, okay, I don't think any software solution gets you to hundred percent, but if you've got 80% and we could work in your case with us to get, to the next 20, you know, what other functionalities do we want to see? What are the things we want to get to? Um, what makes you feel better about the, the growth of, of the solution? Yeah. Talking about, about future um, things. So I know we, um, we, 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 we talked about LBL and the implementation, but I'm curious, what would you, what would you see are some of the exciting things you expect about scheduling and planning? Uh, or I'll build to create a build. What are some of the, the things you'd like to see that are maybe, you know, even a couple years out, but why is that going in your mind? So the first thing that just popped into my mind when you asked this, um, all right, this might be more than a couple of years out. And this is, this is a pretty far out, uh, thing that I, I, this would be awesome to happen though. So, okay. Um, it's a little wild, but so I do, we do a lot of reality capture, capturing our job sites, um, vis visual, you know, modeling 360 photos, whatever of what's going on in our job site and all this AI analysis of what you visually capture, uh, is starting to become a reality now where just from 360 photos or from a model or whatever, um, an AI can know what is going on, how much ductwork has been installed, stuff like that. I would love this. Trust, it will go back to scheduling and planning. I would love if all this re reality capture that we're capturing our job sites can know where we are and have this tied into the schedule too and know, okay, there was not as much, um, uh, doctor work installed this week as we we're supposed to, all this automatically becomes a, a flag a roadblock or whatever. And this automatically talks to our scheduling software, then letting us know that we're behind schedule over here. And so instead of having to know all these percent completes and whatnot, that's automatically all tracked and then flagged, uh, because it's not where it's supposed to be according to the schedule. I know that's, uh, there are little parts of that that are kind of being done right now, but maybe separated, maybe not an ideal workflow, but if that could all be mostly automated, that would be really, really awesome right now to do that. It requires a good amount of, um, of hands-on work and analyzing it and having data talk to each other and whatnot. But if we could have all of that automated, that would be really fantastic. All that data talking to each other. It's uh, no, it's a I little mean, we'll, bit of a we'll far out uh, expectation, but, but I, yeah, we'll get there. That that would be awesome. You know, having some kind of automated progress capture from the field that updates your look ahead, that flags roadblocks, that flags your things on your schedule. That I'll just have to. How do we connect what's in the field and what's in, in your schedule? I think it's going to have to be yeah. that that connection. But well, surely you get there. I mean, maybe not so, in the next year or two, but it's 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 going to happen. Uh, at some point, the more automation we're building, but I, I love that you're bringing back the roadblocks, uh, and, and I think that that could be my last question. Um, you know, well, at first I just want to say, um, for for the record, you you said that it's on Outbuild's roadmap for next year now to have what I just said, right? That's what you exactly. said. Exactly. Next year. Exactly. Okay. Cool. All right. <laughs> the, it's, secret it's road, the secret roadmap. The secret roadmap. The scanner roadmap. <laughs> yeah. Um, but on on the on the roadblocks, you know, that I think it's one of the most important feature of the platform because we connect scheduling and planning. We have the proper integration, but um, 
everything you talked about today, I think is was how do we pre-plan? How do we raise flags? Um, and I think if you used other solutions, some other companies had that tool, uh, but in general, what, you know, in your opinion, what is the, how important it is to be able to have a, a live dashboard of all those issues in, in terms of delivering projects on time? And maybe what has been the feedback from some of the teams that are leveraging the, that, that type of process? Um, I mean, I know it's super critical because like we were talking about before is, you know, knowing what's happening or knowing in advance potential issues so that you can save time in the future. I mean, that's exactly what that roadblock is and having it, having it tied with Procore submittals and whatnot, uh, like you guys do. Um, that's all super critical because we're, we want to know about those roadblocks ahead of time so that we can not encounter problems later on. So, um, I don't know if I have specific feedback from the teams about, about roadblocks specifically. Um, but, uh, I, I mean, I know it is absolutely critical to the job to have that. I mean, even when we were, you know, just doing our look aheads in Excel, we had our own, um, roadblocks on there. Roadblocks log, and, yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it's incredibly important to the job and the way that you guys are able to, I mean, you can manually add in roadblocks, but having it semi-automated by talking to data from Procore too, that's just even more helpful because anything that can bring a problem to your attention without you having to like go out and look for it is really helpful because it's, it can be very hard to know exactly what's going on everywhere on your job site at once. So, uh, having, having outbuilt at least help draw your eyes to the right place, um, can be extremely beneficial. And that's exactly how you say that people are doing it, right? Job site, they are flagging issues, but if you don't have a process to track it, if it's a phone or an email or a text or a piece of paper, it's so easy to forget about something. Um, and I don't know if you joined the uh, the trailer talk we had, I think it was yesterday on the iPad, but um, now we're seeing more and more subcontractors or trade partners walking the field and, oh, there's a cone icon I'm going to click and tell you what my issues are. Um, and often for too long, it's been the feedback of, you know, the don't tell me what your problems are. I don't want to be the one creating a problem, but is this, it's construction. There's always something up. Let the team know so that you could get help because often for trade partners, it's not their fault and it's not at their hand to get the other contract out of the way or to get that R5 approved. Um, and that's just a way to voice your problem before it's too late so that we could help you out. And, and that's really the approach with the with the roadblocks. And for some people, it's oh, it's unbelievable that people would do this. You know, we talk to different teams like, oh, they'll never engage, they'll never do this. But at least they have the opportunity if they want to. And you'll be surprised more, mm -hmm. more trade partners want to share that than, than you might think. Yeah. Absolutely. And then, yeah, the more people use that, the better. I mean, we're like we talked about, we're trying to learn about all these problems beforehand. And if we can have those trade partners involved in it too, and learning us that it even helps because we can't, we can't know everything and be involved with everything at once. We, we rely on our trade partners to let us know of issues that they have that will impact their schedule that might impact another person's schedule. And it all, it all <laughs> affects each other. It all connects together. Um, well, Ben, yeah. that, that was awesome. I know we, I know we have five five minutes left, so we could use it to uh, to wrap up. And Lee, you could you could cut out. But uh, great chat. I, I learned a lot. Things that I didn't know. Uh, 